thank you for uh, being able to have Stuart with us this morning. We thank you for his amazing gift of preaching. Lord, and as we, uh, as we listen this morning, Lord, I pray that through Stuart, you will speak directly into the hearts of each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Graham. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to be here on this special day, especially for our friend Mal. But it's just a joy to be here. Now, David has t instructed me on to what to, not what to say, but where to say it from. So if you have a Bible, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 4? Uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll attempt some of it. It's a marvelous um, chapter. We'll, we'll look at some of it but, and see how it relates to, to us. Let's just start at verse 14. Luke 4, if you have the Bible, don't worry, I'll read it to you. Jesus, Jesus had a, he's had about a, a, a year's ministry, and he returns to Galilee, verse 14, in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. As he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. On rolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to, pre to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. I'll stop there because we, we have unlimited time. David says, I have to finish by four o'clock. And, I'm, and I, 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 we have a meal promise, which is even more tempting. Uh, but uh, it's great to be here. So let's just pick it up, really. Jesus, I say, he's... He's had about a year's ministry. It's not in Luke's gospel. It's in Matthew and Mark. It's been a year, and he comes back. This is his hometown. He is he's amazed. People are amazed at him. His teaching is amazing. And, he, and not only that, he heals the sick. People are really sick, genuinely ill. And he casts out demons. They're amazed. And they say, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Where he, they said, where did, he get, where did he get this from? Who gave him this wisdom, they said. They, they're, they're amazed by him. And um, you know, he's the talk of the town. He's been, as I say, he's been around, there are 240 villages around that area, and Jesus has been going around them. And people are amazed. There's no NHS, no antibiotics, and yet people are miraculously healed and set free. This is the real deal. Nothing fake about this guy. And he's in town this weekend. He's back home seeing his, his mother. And um, he always goes to the synagogue. And uh, people are amazed. I mean, he's from Nazareth. I mean, Nazareth, there is a saying in those days. Can any good ever come from Nazareth? It is what we would call a dump. But he's from Nazareth. And he comes back and it's... He's going to go to the synagogue. He always went every Saturday. Well, he'd probably go midweek as well. But he's going to go on Saturday. This, this, coming, Lord, this coming Sabbath, he's going to be there. And, um, and, and he comes. It's amazing. Now, you know the synagogue. The, uh, they follow a pattern. The synagogue service they always follow a pattern. You have the Psalms. Then you have the Shema. Hear, O God, the Lord your God is one. Then you have the Blessings. 
Then you have a reading from Moses, the Torah, with interpretation or application. Then finally, you have a reading from the prophets, and somebody then would interpret the prophets, or the prophet of the day, as it were. And, and this is, in God's sovereignty, the, the, one of the attendants offers, gives him, when the, reading the prophet comes, he hands to Jesus, takes the scroll from the library, as it were, and says, there it is. And it's, it's Isaiah. And Jesus opens it up. And um, it's amazing. And he reads it. And we, as I've read it, it's all, to, and he, it's all to do with him. The sovereign Lord is upon me. You know, he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. And he sent me and to, re, you know, he's to release the oppressed. And it's all to do with me. And, and, and then at the end... He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, this is, this is one of the great mom moments in world history. Let's not minimize that. It's, you know, it's more than Martin Luther King's great sermon on the Washington Mall. It's probably more like the broadcast from the BBC at the end of the, the, the Second World War, that peace has been declared. It's, it's the great, one of the greatest spoken few sentences ever spoken on this planet. It's amazing. And, and we'll, we'll see why. And it's all to do with God's grace. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Now we know, as you will remember, that he has been filled with, baptized in the Spirit, anointed with the Spirit, about a year before in the Jordan with, when he's with, with John. The Spirit of God has come upon him. And he's, gone, he's begun his ministry. He doesn't begin anything before then. But the people were amazed at this man. You know, they, they couldn't believe it. Isn't this, you know, I have a chair in our house, says the person. He made it. His dad, uh, he and his dad built our barn. And um, we sat, I sat next to them as he grew up in the synagogue. Isn't this Mary's son? They're amazed. And yet... He is the talk of the town. They're flocking from other villages. You've got to get, come early this Saturday. She won't get a parking place, you know. Come. They're all progressing to this. And, and sure enough, he delivers this, this great speech. It's interesting. You notice it's a, it's a word of grace. Because you notice in your Bible where he stops. He stops mid-sentence. He actually st he stops where there's a comma, not where there's a full stop. And he says to proclaim, you know, the day of the Lord's favor. And then he doesn't, he doesn't go on to say, the, and the day of the Lord's vengeance. He stops before then. He, he deliberately, you see. Because he, he says, this is to do today with God's grace. God's going to give you a, a full amnesty for what's coming. The day of judgment will come. The day of vengeance will come. But today is the day of grace. This is a grave opportunity, a day of opportunity. Oh, Paul will say, you know, that it will come this day. It will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels and he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That day will come. But this day is the day of grace. And the day we'll enkindle today, the 16th of January. This is a day of grace. And that's what he's saying. Now, and of course, then he's going to unpack what is this day of grace. Well, let's turn to your Bible. Let's look at it. It's a day of good news. Well, uh, I read it says the NIV, uh, the, not the, the authorized version, uh, the gospel. What is the gospel? Now, some of you have been coming to church for hundreds of years by the Lord. No, sorry. <laughs> But you know, what is the gospel? It's good news. The good news, it, it's not good advice. It's good news. It's n nothing you have to do initially. You have, first of all, to hear the good news. It's not... See, all religions are to do with good advice. A wise man comes you and tells you, you know, here is the way to find God. But that's not what we're on about. That's not Christianity. No, Christianity is not to do with that. It's a man who comes and says, I am God. Right? The good news does not come through Jesus Christ. 
The good news is Jesus Christ, right? That's what it's all about. And, um, and, and Jesus, you know, says, I've come to bring good news. I've come, I, it's all good news. And I apologize for people who've been brought up in churches, Protestant, Catholic churches, who to them, church and religion, it just, it just fills them with, well, gloom and fear. As one man said, I heard this week, he said, it was like being hit every week with a two by four around your head. Well, if you were brought up in one of those churches, I, I apologize for, for that. But it's, it's a, if it's not good news, you haven't got it, my friends. Right? Let's, let's leave it to that. We could go on with that. Right. And you see, Jesus, you know, it's not where can we find God. Jesus says, I have come to find you. That's God comes on earth. That's what it's about. And, um, and um, Jesus has come to take away our burdens. It's all... It's, it's through grace. And, let, and let's, let's, let's unpack it because it's, it's clearly it for us. Because actually, it's the Jubilee year. You know, remember Deuteronomy 15. All debts for the Jews, every seventh year, were to be cancelled. All debts. Wouldn't it be wonderful if MasterCard and Visa and your bank manager would... That's a great policy. Let's accept that. I'm not sure they will, so don't hang on. Don't... Don't have to lift your hopes. But every seven years, that would happen. Not only that, every seven years, and I won't give you the text, every seven years, the, the, the slaves had to be set free. Now, many Jews became slaves, lastly, because when you went into debt and, and you couldn't pay a debt, you, were, you sold yourself into, to, to your credits into slavery. You gave your labor. You became a slave. And, and you were obliged to save them. Every seven years, though, that had to be cancelled. And then, every seven times seven years, on the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, the trumpet would sound, and all land had to be restored to its original owners. You got your inheritance back. Can you remember when Israel came into Promised Land, when the children of Israel came into Canaan, God determined that every tribe had a portion of land, and every family in that tribe had a portion of land. It was designated. You couldn't mess around. It was given. Under God, they waited under God and designated it for every family. But trading and life was hard. So he said, well, I'll sell a few acres. I'll sell a few fields, and I'll have to sell half the farm because I'm trading bad. Things are bad. And so many people sold land just to keep going. On the 50th year, on the 50th year, all land had to be restored to the original family. It's the year of Jubilee. The trumpet sounded, and all land, you got your inheritance back that had been lost over the, over the last 50 years. The sad thing is, and it's proven this, through the hundreds of years, never once was the year of Jubilee ever acknowledged or recognized or practiced. But it was there. Isaiah uh, 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 put it down. A man will come who will lead you into this. But it was all in the Torah, the first five books. And, now, and Isaiah spells it out. Jesus said, today, 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 this has come. It's amazing, really. And, um, and, and that's what it's about. And Jesus says the scripture will be fulfilled, right? I am the promised one, Isaiah spoke about, through whom, you know, this will happen. I will do for you what you cannot do for yourself or for each other. Because, you know, our problems and our personal quirks are so entrenched and deep and profound. And not only that, they have eternal consequences, Right? When, when you die, my friends, and I go to many funerals now, I get such, tw be careful what I say, rubbish um, spoken. When you die, my friends, if you, your problems don't end if you're, not, if you're an unbeliever. Let's be clear about that. Your problems will be exacerbated a thousand times. That's why God sent his son. The problems were so great. But anyway, 
<laughs> Jesus says the problem is so great. And each one of us, need, but he says, I've come, to, I've come to preach the good news to the poor. And the poor is not just financially poor. The word that's used is, it just simply means uh, someone who's uh, sort of, who shrinks back, who cowers, who backs off, who, who's, it's like it's used of a beggar in the shadows. And, um, you know, you, our, our, your sin, your uh, self-righteousness, your selfishness, your rebellion against God, is, because of that, you're destitute, you're morally poor, you're, you're in a poor way, you're bankrupt. And this is true of every one of us. The better, once we realize it, hope begins. If you realize you're poor in spirit, all the kingdom is yours, says Jesus. Anyway. But people say, well, I can't say. I've got plenty of money here in Kendall. Well, Jesus says, remember, he says, to, he says, you are saying, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. But Jesus said, don't you realize that you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. You think you're fine. Look, look at my house in Kendall, in Cumbria today. Look, see my car, see my job. Jesus says, what will it profit you to gain the whole world? You've gained everything in Cumbria, your house, in your career. What will it profit you if you've got, and you lose your eternal soul? This son of God, you hear his heart, don't you? Anyway, he comes. You see, what he's offering is grace. We have to throw ourselves on his grace. I was reading last night, you must read it, C.S. Lewis's little book called The Great Divorce. It's a, it's a, a strange story about a bus trip from hell to heaven. And there's, it's an encounter of different people. And this, this guy, has, from going from hell, meets one of these angels who's guiding him. And he sees there some, a guy who used to work for him. And he says he was a bloody murderer. And so sure he was. He was convicted and he went to prison. And what's he doing here? And to cut the story short, I won't keep you too long on this. He said, well, everything's free. You have to plead. You know, it's free. And this man says, I'm not accepting any bleeding charity of anybody. And the bright angel says, oh, but you must. But he says, I've got my rights. He said, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it's all free. You have to plead the bleeding charity. It's all free. And that's what it's about. That's where we start this morning. You know, you have to, it's all free. It's grace. You know? And, and, uh, and that's where we start. And it's all a gift, right? It, uh, everything we, we have is a gift, Right? Jesus says, look, I've come and I will live a perfect life and I will have a perfect righteous account before God. And I want to do it. I'm doing it all for you. I've come to live and die for you. A friend of mine died last two weeks ago and I took his funeral. And I used to ring him. And I said, how did they do? I mean Manchester City. And he said, they won. No, he, no, he said, sorry, we won. I said, we <laughs> You never left the house. Oh, we won. Now, I know what he was saying. Those lads in blue, pale blue had been representing him. And when they won, he won. <laughs> Everything that Jesus did, he did for you. He didn't need to come at all. There was no obligation. There's no need for him to come. It was pure grace. He did it for you. <laughs> all he was doing. And uh, we have to receive it. That's what Paul says. When we receive God's abundant uh, gift of grace and free gift of righteousness, we then, he says, we reign in life. If you want to win in life, you first start by uh, accepting God's abundant gift of righteousness. I'll unpack it in a minute. Just to, but it's just to say it's all free. It's a gift. And um, there's nothing we can do. And it's no good pleading our rights. That's all that won't work. But he says, I've come to preach good news to the poor, those who realize they have nothing. But then he goes on. And I, you could spend a long while on each one of these. He, has, he sent me to, pre, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. You know, th these, as I said, these, these uh, Israelites became, 
you know, um, they had problems because of financial problems. Like I said they put themselves into slavery. It's the only way. It's, it was a legal procedure. And on the day of Jubilee, they were set free. Jesus, I've come to do that for all of you. The word aphasis he uses means forgiveness. See, we are bound. We're bound by guilt. We've done terrible things. Think, I can remember things I did 50, 60, 60 years ago. Things I've done, I haven't kept the law. I'm bound by guilt. I'm condemned by law, the guilt. I can, live, I can put it on the carpet. But not only that, I'm condemned by the law of God. I stand condemned by it. I'm a prisoner to it in one sense. But not only that, I'm a prisoner to Satan in one sense. Jesus says, you know, the strong man keeps his goods in peace, talking about sin. See, the non-Christian in Kendall says, well, I'm at peace, I don't need you. Here's just Jesus says, the Satan keeps his people in peace. He keeps them in peace. They feel fine. They're not troubled. No, no, Jesus, he guards his goods in peace. So we're bound by our sin, by our guilt, but, and, and by sin and the law of God, but also we're bound by a principle in ourselves. Why do I do what I do? The good that I want to, I don't want to do, I find myself doing, says Paul. There is a power within us. Not just a theological idea. There's a, a power, it's, there's an old nature in us. And it binds us. And not only that, we, we're bound by, you know, that, that these things bind us. And uh, we're, we're held captive. But Jesus comes and... <laughs> He comes to set you free, you know? He breaks the power, says Wesley, cancel sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. I, I've come, he says. No, we, you have to unpack all this. I'm just giving you the headings. He's come to set the, you free from all the things, Satan, sin, the law of God, guilt. He comes and sets you free. And then he goes on, he says, the recovery of sight to the blind. You see, we can't see. We you know, we, I've been a lot to India 20 odd times and I remember staying in a hospital. The guy there just went out and did clinics and thousands, hundreds of thousands in India are born congenitally blind. And it's amazing, this guy went and did several clinics every year, every summer. Well. And with a small, almost like one of the cataract op, that similar thing, these, these young people were just given sight. But the Bible says we are born spiritually blind. We don't see it. You know, it's a fact of every human being. The man without the Spirit, says Paul, does not receive the things that come from the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. I heard something this week, I'm not going to mention there, was mocking Jesus on the BBC. But, you know, they're well-known, called a national treasure, whatever that means. But they don't see. Whether you're Professor Dawkins or you're Richard Attenborough, they don't see it. They can't see it. They're born spiritually blind. It's a fact. Jesus comes to give sight to the blind. Right? The God of this world has blinded the hearts of those who don't believe. It's... <laughs> That's what Paul says, you know. And they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They can't see it. They're wonderful, kind, nice people. Your relatives are wonderful and kind and lovely and are great. But they don't see it. And they're intelligent, they're brighter than you are. But they don't see it because it needs a miracle to make a Christian. It needs a miracle of grace to open their eyes. It, it has to happen. Peter said, Jesus says to Peter, who do, you, who do you think I am? And Peter at the end says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Je Jesus says, you didn't work that out. My Father in heaven revealed that to you. He said, there has to be grace. There has to be revelation that Jesus comes. But he comes. Why are we here this morning? Not because we're spiritual. God, God knows we're not. But actually by his grace, he's opened their eyes. Right? That's how it works. And he comes to do it. That's the gospel. Now you can unpack all these when you have time. But he comes to do that. I mean, when he meets Paul on the Damascus Road, remember, he says, I'm sending you 
to them. He says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. That's what you're going to do, Paul, by what you're preaching. And then he goes on quickly. To release the oppressed, the downtrodden, the crushed. You know, I've been a pastor now for 40 odd years. And you know, you, you meet people crushed. They're abused in relationships, sexual, physical, emotional. People are damaged, broken people. And it's, you know, it's, life has crushed them. They're try, it's a, they're, well, you know, as well as I do, they're overwhelmed by the pain of life. You know, Jesus, we sang that lovely song, you know. Jesus come to relieve their burdens, to lift their yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden, we all have to carry stuff. My burden is light. <laughs> He's come to, 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 to heal. He's, I said, I'm going to put my spirit in you. It's not a quick fix. I'm not saying that. Because most of us, after many years, I've, you know, we bring a lot of trash into the kingdom. We damage goods when we arrive. And it's a lifetime of unscrewing us, as it were. But he comes, doesn't it? He's come to set us free. He's come to set us free. To, to release the oppressed. And to set us free. And um, it, only, it takes time, though, doesn't it? It takes time. Not only it takes that, it only happens because he is willing to, to pay the price. We have people over our life very graciously have, le have lent us money. I'm just, you may be the same. And the even more gracious thing is when they've said at the end, you can count it a gift. We like that. <laughs> but the point is, they have had to forfeit, they have had to pay the cost. They have lost when they've said, you know, you can have it. Everything we have is because Jesus comes, the Son of God comes. That, our debt with God, which is mounted to the skies, may be dealt with, right? That our inheritance may be restored. Adam, our first friend, lost our inheritance. And our inheritance now is hell. But no, no, but our, our original inheritance was to be with God forever. Jesus, I've come to restore that. That's where he's come. But it only, it only happens by him absorbing it in his body on the cross. That's how it works. He said, I haven't come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. And... Uh, See, the good news is not simply he forgives us. He does forgive us, and that's amazing. But actually, he, put, he makes us righteous. We have a right standing before God. It's, to use a posh word, it, we are justified. We're made right. Through the obedience of one man, says the apostle Paul, many shall be made righteous. And that's how it works. In other words, we are given a new status. An eternal status that's never taken away. It's God that justifies. Who is to condemn? Right? You know? You see, we're not just forgiven. As wonderful as that. It's a great thing. But we're given a new status. You see, you may be knighted, or you may be made a lord, and the queen may do that. But I tell you this, she wouldn't be too keen if you nip round for tea every lunch, every tea time. But when you become a Christian, you're made part of the family. You're not just forgiven. You're, given a, you're made a, a child of God. That's, that's how it works, you know? You see, I, well, it's too complicated, this. People don't understand this. Of course we understand it. We're always trying to justify ourselves, to justify our existence, right? We're always, the world's full of it. That I am of worth, I'm of quality, I'm, I'm of significance. I remember watching that film um, uh, uh, with Eric Liddell, you know, the Chariots. Chariots of Fire. I remember one line, one line, the run, it was uh, to do with a hundred yard dash, hundred meters now. Isn't it? He said, When that gun goes off, I have 10 seconds to justify my existence. He knew what justification meant. The mother says, I don't feel I'm any use, but when I look at those two boys, I feel that justifies my existence. That's what I live for. 
I work so hard because I, in my firm, it justifies my existence when we get good figures at the end. And when I was made redundant, I felt I was nothing, I was useless. Now we, we're always longing to be justified, to be accepted, to be loved. We're all like that. And when you become a Christian, you're not just forgiven, you are put in a new state altogether, right? You, you become his child. And he loves you as much as he loves Jesus. I said, I don't believe that. Well, I tell the scripture, John 17, 23. Jesus says, look, I pray that they may be brought to complete unity so and the world may know that you love me and have loved them even as you have loved me. John 17, 23, live in that verse. Do you mean, I don't believe that. I know you don't. That's the problem. <laughs> Jesus said, I want you to know that. You're not just forgiven. You are, you are made righteous, not only made righteous, you brought into the family of God. You are loved. I mean, John says, he says, how great is the love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called as children of God, and that is what we are. It's interesting, in your Bible, there's a word missing in the Greek. The Greek is a little word, it says, it means behold, see. I don't know why they missed it out. Because we need to see it. See how great is the love the Father has for us. See. Why did they miss that word? I suppose they didn't like the word behold. It's too old-fashioned. But, you know, and, and he loves us. He loves us as much as he loves his only begotten son. We're adopted. But he loves us just as much. You, you know that. I, I have... A friend of mine died about a few weeks ago. And I remember, this is years ago, his mother and dad, his, mom, his dad was our Sunday school teacher. He adopted a little girl. She's still alive. And I know, without any doubt, that mom and dad loved Catherine as much as they loved Michael. They loved the adopted one as much as they loved the, the natural one. How much more? It's true. Jesus said, I want you to know I keep praying that, right? And he never changes. Now, not everybody's a child of God. David quite rightly rang from one. He's not the father of all mankind. I'm sorry. The hymn is a great hymn, but it's a wrong line, is that? He is only, to those who received him, who believed on his name, to them he gave the right to be told the children of God, Right? No, you become a child of God, as the other reading we had. You know, become when we're born again. Now, all, all, all men and women are made in the image of God, and special, and all creatures. But you become a child of God when you come into the, the family of God through faith in Christ. <laughs> and and he's wanting to know that. Now, nothing changes, you know. We all change. People get older. Some people have birthdays even. A men's age. A men's age. You know. But we're all getting older. Even David, who's the, the eternal youth, you know. I mean, we're all getting... <laughs> you know, and I... I mean, you know, I, I, everything changes. It's 55 years since we first moved into Kendall. And it's radically different. Everything changes. But I want to tell you, the love of God never changes. His love for you has never... And you, you've not been a great Christian, but his love for you has not diminished. You've been a poor show, but his love for you has not diminished one way, bit. I have a, a dear couple who adopted two children. I'll try and cover my tracks. They've just been horrendous. One is in prison. He'll probably be in prison most of his life. He comes out and commits. The other, the other lad is an alcoholic. And I go... I mean, you know, they're now in their 80s. But I want to tell you this. They've never stopped loving those two boys. I am amazed, amazed at their grace. And it doesn't get easy, it seems. And, but how much more the love of God for us, right? You know, you will never, Christian, lose your status. We still have the old nature. We still have to put to death the deeds of the flesh. We still have the old, body, the old nature that you know, rises up and does things that we're ashamed of. We have to put to death these things. But as regards our standing and our status, 
We are fixed eternally. We are secure. We, are like, I don't, we don't have to prove anything. In your work, in your athleticism, in, in your house. Christian, you don't have to prove anything. We are loved. We're accepted. We're in. See, if you've forgiven, if you've forgiven, the man said, you can go now. You can go. You're forgiven. But justification, God says, you can come. That's the thing. Don't go. This is home. And, um, and Paul says, through the obedience of one man, Many were put in the category of, the word means put in the class of, put in the form of righteous. That's who you are. You may not feel it this morning. When I came back from America two weeks ago, it's wonderful to see the sign, UK Nationals. That's where I go. I mean, I felt you don't feel like it. I don't embrace the local, you know, civil, you know, attendance. Say we're in Britain again. But, you know, that's who we are. And that's who we are. We're declared righteous. We're accepted. And that's, how we, that's where we start. And he comes to us, those who are poor in spirit. And he says, you know, he comes as the physician of those who are crushed. He comes as the, the liberator of those who, who have been trapped and messed around and bashed and bruised and in bondage. He said, I've come to set you free. No, I know. I've been a pastor for a long time. And <laughs> it's, an, it's not a quick fix. It needs a lot of fixing and love and care and ministry. But that's Jesus' job. He's quite happy to work together with us. And, um, but now as we, as we go out now, we can face all things. If he's with us and for us, what need do we see that we can't face? What, you know... <laughs> What can't be healed and put right if God is, if Jesus is for us and with us? And um, we have to look at Jesus. As one great Scottish saint says, for every look at yourself, take ten looks at Jesus. But you have to get, this is basic stuff. I appreciate that. That's interesting when Paul came. When Paul came to, to Rome, he says in the first chapter, I want to come and preach the gospel to you. Well, they're all Christians. Yeah, but we forget. We, you know, we prog- we, we've gone on, we've got past that. You never get past this stuff. You, you live in this stuff. You live in the gospel. The gospel is not the start plug to get you going. It's the whole engine. The gospel is not the door to let you in. The gospel is the living room in which we work. The gospel is not A, B, C. The gospel is A to Z. We live in this stuff. We're obsessed by it. It's wonderful. We feed on it. Every day we read the gospel. Tell me the old, old story for I forget so soon. That's it, isn't it? And, and, and I, I know David won't say this, and I say it gladly. This is not just for us. This is for this town. It's interesting. If we time to go on and my time has gone, they didn't like it. Because he said, actually, you know, God's mercy was on some pagan general. And God healed some foreign woman. Really? God's grace is for us, the Jews. No, it's not. It is for you, but it's for the whole world. We sang it. God so loved the world. (laughs) And they tried to kill him. Didn't get much expenses that day. He just tried to push him off the edge of a cliff. (laughs) His sermon didn't go down too well. (laughs) It's good news. He said, this is the day the trumpet has sounded. Christians, in Kendall, the trumpet has sounded. There's nothing greater or better or more wonderful than Jesus and the gospel. He's come to bring good news to those who feel they're wretched and poor. Right? He's come to set the captives free, and this town is full of captive people. He's come to give sight to the blind. People say, well, who don't get it. And then suddenly they get it. It's wonderful. And Jesus says, this is why I've come. And this is actually why this church was started and will continue. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray by your spirit you will fill us again with an enthusiasm 
for you, for the gospel, and for those people outside who couldn't care less, who are blind, lost, wretched people, affluent, contented, but lost eternally. Lord, fill our hearts with compassion. May the love of Christ constrain us, control us, compel us. We ask it in Jesus' sake and for his glory. Amen.